Okay, well, let's open up in prayer and we'll get started because we have a lot to go through this, I almost said this morning, this evening. So join with me in prayer. Father in heaven, we come to you sitting at your feet and recognize that you are the true living God. And you are a God who cares about what happens to each of our lives. And you're working out your perfect plan in each of our lives, Father. We thank you for that. And we thank you that when we go through difficult times, trials, and tribulations, Father, that you are with us. And that your word says, as we remain faithful to you and don't compromise, that you will deliver us, even if it's not from death, but even through death, you can deliver us from our enemies. And we thank you and we praise you and give you all the glory forever and ever. Amen. So we're going to go through chapters 5, 6, and 7 tonight. In chapter 5, I'm not going to spend a very long time in because it's very similar to Daniel chapter 4. And so last week on your handout, I didn't get a chance to go through. Just as a reminder, um, you're going to see that we talked about early on in the first session, we talked about how Daniel, the book, is made up of a chiastic pattern. And the pattern is it starts off with exile to the unclean realm of the dead. Then it's followed by four kingdoms, followed by the kingdom of God. Then you see the deliverance of the faithful, the trusting people of God from the fiery furnace. Then you see the humbling of proud King Nebuchadnezzar. And here in chapter 5, we're going to see we're now going to work the opposite of that pattern. And we're going to start with the humbling of the proud King Belshazzar. Then we're going to go into the deliverance of the trusting from the lion's den and then talk about four kingdoms followed by the kingdom of God. And then chapters 10 through 12 end with the return from exile and the resurrection from the dead. And so we begin this where in chapter 5 where something dramatic happens. There's a pattern that we see. Kings can't figure it out. Magicians and wise men can't figure it out. And then in this chapter, Daniel chapter 5, we're going to see that the queen remembers that there is one named Daniel who has been able to interpret the dreams, who the spirit of the living gods live in him, and he can interpret the king's dreams. And this is a very big parallel to what happened to the story of Joseph, if you remember from Genesis, that he's remembered Wait, there was this guy when he was in prison and he interpreted my dream and he saved my life, but the baker got his head cut off. So he could do this. Go call him. Very same scenario that's happening here. So we get into uh, verses 1 through 4 where you see that this is Belshazzar's pride is on display. And you have to remember, he's King Nebuchadnezzar's son. So everything that he saw King Nebuchadnezzar go through, all the details of his life from him reigning in pompous, from him declaring what God can save you out of my hands, to seeing his father go in and act like a beast, he's lived it, he's been around it, he's heard the stories, known about it, and this is how Belshazzar responds as he's king. And it says in verse 1, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Very immediately we see Belshazzar throws a party, invites all of his lords, all of his people there. And because a thousand of his lords isn't party enough, he decides that he wants to make the party spicier. He wants to make it the best party it can be. So what does he do? These idols, these, not these idols, these items, the vessels of God that were dedicated and consecrated to be used by a holy God for these holy rituals, he brings them out and says, we're going to eat off of them. We're going to drink out of them. These cups that were designated towards the God of the Jews, we're going to use it for our party. And this was a slap in the face to the Jews who were in exile to see this other nation taking these vessels that were consecrated to a holy God and used by this country, by this king, to just eat off of. And so it's a slap in the face to all these Jews and to their God. And these temple, these temple vessels are now being defiled, 
And is God going to stand by and just watch that happen? Absolutely not. We're going to see what he did with King Nebuchadnezzar, the pride that he had and how he was humbled. God, in the same way, is going to humble Belshazzar. And so again, what he's doing with these vessel items, remember a few sessions ago we talked about how when um, King Nebuchadnezzar took the items from the temple, that this was an echo of 1 Samuel 5 where they, the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and put it in the temple of their god Dagon and then the thing kept falling over and eventually it was destroyed and then the people were like, get this thing out of here. This is the very same echo that we pick up on again where we see the same thing happening. Uh-oh, remember the Philistines, remember Dagon, God's going to do it again. God will not allow his idol- this, their idolatry to continue. And then it ends with, They were using these vessels and then praising the gods of bronze, gold, silver, stone, and wood. The mockery of these temples that were dedicated to the true living God, they're not giving any praise and glory, but the idols that they make out of of these materials that God had created, they're giving worship to. And what a blaspheme to the true and living God who we've seen all the way up to this point show He's the sovereign over the world. He's king of the world. And he's not just going to sit by and let this blatant idolatry happen. Then we see verses 5 through 9 where Belshazzar receives judgment from God. It says, Immediately the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand, and the king saw the hand as it wrote. Now just imagine you're there, you're partying, you're having fun, and you see a hand writing on the wall, okay? Everyone's freaking out. It's, Jim, are you seeing what I'm seeing? Is there a hand on the wall? There's a hand on the wall. Now you got this pompous, arrogant, all-powerful, mighty king using these vessels of the true living God, and he's the most powerful person in the world, and look at how he responds to this handwriting on the wall in verse 6. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him, His limbs gave way, and I love how it says this, and his knees knocked together. Already the humbling is beginning. This pride, powerful king, by one hand on a wall, riding with a finger, he's immediately shook to his core and realizes he is in the presence of something more powerful and greater than he is, and he doesn't know what it is, who it is, and he is trembling in fear. And not only that, not only is he trembling and in fear, but the queen is the one who actually shows wisdom and discernment and shows strength and shows humility. And look at what she says. The king, I'm sorry, verse seven goes, the king loudly called to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, and the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the what? Third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. Verse 10, the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banqueting hall, and the queen declared, O king, live forever. Let not your thoughts alarm you or your color change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom the spirit of the, is the spirit of the holy gods and the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods were found in him, and King Nebuchadnezzar, Your father, your father the king, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, Chaldeans, and astrologers, because an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems were found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. So here we have this queen, his wife, showing, hey, there is a man who is different from any other person in your kingdom. 
And not only is he important and can interpret dreams, he interpreted your father's dreams. And when your father had dreams that he could not interpret, he went to this man who there was a spirit of the holy gods. And again, they're not recognizing the true living God, but they're recognizing that there is favor upon this Daniel that nobody else in the kingdom has. And so when they're trying to figure out what does this mean, the queen is instantly reminded of the one who has the revelation that is given to him by God. And so she reminds him that your own father used Daniel. Go get him right now. Then verses 13 to 28, we won't read them, but we're going to see that this is where Daniel interprets the handwriting. And here's a few things that happen within those verses. And you can go back later and read them because we want to get through 6 and 7 tonight. But Daniel comes before the king. And at this point, Daniel would probably be in his 60s, probably 62 or so, they say. So he's not a young whippersnapper anymore. He's an older man. He's been there. He's wise. He stands before him. And then in verses 18 to 23, he goes into the whole backstory of King Nebuchadnezzar and shares with, with Belshazzar, here is what has happened to your father. And he goes through this for a purpose because he wants to remind him, Belshazzar, you knew all of this. You knew what happened to your father and yet you still chose to disobey the one and true living God and desecrated his holy vessels. And he shares this to tell Belshazzar, this is why the interpretation of this dream, of this, of this writing is happening to you. This is why God is writing on the walls because you forgot who the living God is and you've made yourself king, yourself God. You forgot who God is and this is why this writing is happening to you. And on your notes, there's, a, there's a, 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 a quote from N.T. Wright. And he says, this is the point that, that God is wanting Nebuch- uh, Belshazzar to remember. There's a sovereign God who is in charge of the world, who holds all things in life, including you and your life. And that's the one thing Belshazzar forgot to remember with all the things that happened with the example of his father. He forgot the sovereign God is in charge of not just the world, but also of his life, and he is accountable for how he was leading the kingdom of Babylon. Because, yeah, there's, there's kingdoms out there that God puts up that they don't honor God and glorify God, but God holds them accountable. God judges those kingdoms, even though you might think they're getting away with it, they're, getting, they're doing all these wicked things, and nothing bad ever happens to them. No, God judges them, God humbles him, them at their time. Even though he sets them up, he still expects them to honor him as king. And here, this is what Daniel wants Belshazzar to remember, is that the God of heaven it also is ruling over his life. And here's the next quote that he, the author gives. He says, The God of heaven has established his kingdom in the Messiah, and now is the sovereign of the nations, whether or not it looks like it. And so Colossians 1.17 is a verse that you can jot down, and I'll read it for you so you don't have to turn there. But again, this reiterates what is happening even in the New Testament. It says this, uh, talking about Jesus, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Okay? Christ is ruling over the entire world in the same way that God is ruling over the entire world. God is sovereign over the entire world. Then we get to the actual handwriting, and you see the many, many, tekel, parsian. Mene stands for God has numbered your days and is repeated twice. Tekel, you have been found weighed. You have been weighed and been found wadding. And so the idea is he's, there's the scale, of, the scale of doing what you should do and not doing what you should do. And he's been found wanting. And what should he have been doing? Well, God gave him the authority to rule this kingdom, but his kingdom was not the quality of kingdom that God expected. God expected the kingdom to honor him as king to point people to the God in heaven instead of pointing it to the human king. And because Belshazzar hasn't done that and has elevated himself above the living God, God says you have been been weighed and you have been found wanting because the quality of your kingdom is not what it should be. And then he gets to Parsi and here's the judgment. Your kingdom is being divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. You guys remember the image of the statue where you had the head of gold, and then as it went down the statue, you had the weaker kingdoms that are happening. Here already, people are, here already you're seeing that Belshazzar is already going to have a weak kingdom. His kingdom is going to be, he's going to be killed, 
and his kingdom is going to be divided between the Medes and the Persians. And already you have the iron mixing with the clay, where already the kingdoms of man weaken and weaken just right away, right after Nebuchadnezzar is gone, his son's here, and already that prophecy is coming true where the people of God, the, the, not the people of God, the pagan empires of the world raise their heads. They only get more chaotic. They only get more evil, and their arrogance only gets greater and greater until they actually weaken themselves. And this is what this judgment is doing. This judgment to Belshazzar was, you're going to lose your kingdom, and the Medes and Persians are taking over your kingdom. Babylon will no longer be in charge. The Medes and the Persians will. Then you see verse 28, if you want to look there in 28. It says, uh, I'm sorry, not 28. Verse 29, then Belshazzar gave the command and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed and Darius the Mede received the kingdom being about 62 years old. Bel Belshazzar's killed no, before he's killed, he elevates Daniel. And this is what people who are living in exile are to get out of the story of the book of Daniel. Is over and over again, you see that God's people remain faithful to do what he has called. And even though they go through trials and tribulations, if they hold fast, they hold on to the fact that God will vindicate them. God will rule in their favor that even if they die themselves, God will still vindicate them in the next life, that there is a vindication for the people of God so they can trust God no matter what happens, and that when God does deliver them, there's the vindication, the deliverance, the vindication, and then there's the exaltation of God's people. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they were vindicated, they were promoted. Daniel was vindicated, and he gets promoted, right? He shows himself the dream to Belshazzar. He shows that this is what's going to happen. He's promoted in the kingdom. And this is what God promises to his people. You remain faithful to me. You will prosper. And this is what happens to Daniel. And then for ourselves, we should live ourselves, live our lives in the exact same way. We should not give the world an opportunity to compromise our beliefs, compromise our convictions, that we should hold fast to what God has called us to do. And when the world comes at us and asks us to do things we shouldn't, we should do what God has called us to do, even if it disobeys the commandments of man, because living for God is what matters most. And so then we get to Daniel chapter six. And Daniel survived chapter five. He's elevated. But then we get to Daniel chapter six. And Daniel six is pretty much, if you look at the first half of the book of Daniel, chapter 6 is the climax of all the chapters that have come before it. And it's kind of this transition moment that happens because chapters 6 and 7 go together. And what we talk about and discuss here is directly tied to what takes place with the Son of Man imagery in Daniel chapter 7. And so chapter 6 picks up a theme from chapters 1 and chapter 3 where God's faithful refused to compromise their beliefs. Daniel and his friends, they said, we're not going to eat the king's food. They had a personal conviction. We're not sure what it was, but they said, we're not going to eat their food. Just let us test us, and we will see if whether or not God is with us. They tested him. Wow, you're better than the people who are eating the king's food. So they went through the trial. God prospered them. Then you have Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They didn't compromise their faith. They said, whether or not God deliver us, we will not bow down to your statue, and we will not worship your gods. And what does God do? Delivers them, vindicates them, promotes them. And here we're going to see that in this chapter, Daniel refuses to pray to the most powerful king in the universe. And guess how that's going to work out for Daniel? If you've been paying attention, what's going to happen to him? He'll be delivered. He'll be vindicated. And what will happen? He'll be exalted, right? So we're picking up the pattern here. This is what happens to the faithful people of God. So verses 1 through 5 of chapter 6. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 100, 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom. And over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account 
so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. There we go again. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. So in these verses, we see that these satraps, these magicians, these wise people, that jealousy motivates them to find fault with this man, Daniel. You have to remember, these satraps, these officials here, are native Medes and Persians. And Daniel is one of three officials who has been promoted to be over the satraps. But Daniel, remember, is a Jewish exile in this kingdom. How dare he be put in a position over me when this is my native kingdom? I'm of this kingdom. I was born in this kingdom. And you put a Jewish exile over me? How dare King Darius. We should be in charge of our own kingdom. This is a Jewish exile. He should be our slaves. So jealousy motivates them to try to accuse Daniel and to come after him. But what happens in verse 3, you see that God's blessing, God's favor poured out over Daniel's life and poured into his life, where when they looked to find something he was doing wrong, they could find nothing to accuse him of. Well, he's not doing this against the king's orders. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's doing his responsibilities. He's doing whatever the king says. Like, we can't find anything wrong with him. So we're going to have to do something to find a way to accuse this guy because they couldn't find a thing. See, this is what even Christians, us today, we're told in Scripture that we are to live our lives in such a way that the world does not have an opportunity to accuse us of any wrongdoing. That when they look at our lives, they can't find anything. The scriptures say it's better to suffer for what is doing right than to do something that we shouldn't be doing. And the idea is it's better for us to obey God and break man's laws than to break God's laws to appease man. Does that make sense? And so this is what is happening with Daniel. This is, he's living out what the New Testament encourages us to do is, hey, remain faithful. Do what you're supposed to do when you're at your workplace. Do it to the best of your ability. Work hard. Work with excellence. Show yourself approved. Like, be different than the rest of the world. Live as God wants you. Glorify him in all things. So when the watching world is looking, they can't pinpoint, like, well, you, you believe in God, but you're not doing anything wrong. So that frustrates them. So here's how they had to go about and find a way to get Daniel in trouble. They found it by connecting fault to the law of his God. And so look at verses 6 through 9. And I summarize these verses this way. The accusers tell King Darius a lie, and you're going to see how that plays out. So 6 through 9, then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. What's that very next word? All. Now, catch this. All the high officials. How many officials were there over the satraps? Three. And who was one of them? Daniel. All the high officials agree. Really? What did they agree to? Let's keep reading. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefix and the satraps, the counselors and the governors, are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction... And sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and the injunction. 
What's the lie? All. What one official would not agree to that statement? Daniel. So they go to King Darius. All of the people are agreeing. This is what you should do. We're going to only pray to you, King Darius. And Daniel absolutely would never pray to King Darius because not one time has he compromised his faith in the true living God who is sovereign over all. And so they go to the king on, based upon a lie and say, King Darius, we all agree this is what you should do. And N.T. Wright, there should be a quote in your handout where he makes a statement. He says, they have agreed to do something that is normal with imperial policy in the ancient Near East. All people should be required to worship the emperor himself as divine. And this is why King Darius agrees to this decree. Because he says, wow, if the people pray to me, then that means they're demonstrating loyalty to me. They recognize me as their emperor. They're recognizing me as divine. And that means I have the loyalty of the kingdom. I have the loyalty of the people. I have the loyalty of the people underneath me, the people that are in charge. And wow, this is a good thing. If all the people are being loyal to me, I have nothing to worry about in my kingdom because everybody recognizes my kingship, my greatness, and that I am divine and I am in charge of the world. So he signs it into action. And because of their tradition, once he signed it, it had to be, and there was no way that that law could change no matter what. And so they set a deadline on it for 30 days that this would be what would happen. So you get to Daniel verse 10. How does Daniel respond to this lie, to this decree? Does he bow his knee? Of course not. He has not one time done that. But actually, he does bow his knee. I should say that. Not bow his knee to King Darius, but he does bow his knee to the father. So verse 10 says, When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Why does he pray towards Jerusalem? Does anybody know? Because the author brings up the point, opens his window, prays towards Jerusalem. Why? Go to 1 Kings chapter, what did you say? Yes, he prayed toward the temple. Why? Go to 1 Kings chapter 8 if you have your Bible. Because this is important for us to pick up on. Because again, as we read scripture, the, I, the authors don't mention things by accident. They don't mention it to be a cliche. They're mentioning it there because they want us to remember the stories of where we've seen this before. And when we understand it in its context of where it happened, we can understand how it's being used now. And this also tells us why Daniel is praying towards Jerusalem and the significance of his prayer and what is he praying for because I know as a kid growing up it was like, oh, Daniel went and he prayed in his room three, three times and yada yada and never told why, never told the significance, never told like what could possibly be the contents of the prayer. But when we go back to 1 Kings chapter 8, I want you to look at verse 30. So in verse 30, we're going to read a few of them. And you have the temple that was built that King Solomon built built this really beautiful temple, dedicated it to the Lord. And then in this chapter, King Solomon is doing a dedication prayer for the temple. And he makes these statements in verse 30. And he says, And listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place and listen in heaven, your dwelling place. And when you hear, forgive. And so here you have the temple of dedication. People are being told to pray towards this place. And Solomon says, look, when the people pray towards this place, your temple, that you will hear in heaven and that you will forgive. Jump down to verse 33 through 35. When your people Israel are defeated before the enemy because they have sinned against you, and if they turn again to you and acknowledge your name and pray and plead with you in this house, then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your people Israel and bring them again to the land that you gave to their fathers. When the heaven is shut up and there is no rain because they have sinned against you, if they pray towards this place and acknowledge your name and turn from their sin when you afflict them. So again, where are they praying towards? They're praying towards the temple, right? And what are they praying for? They're repenting. They're asking for God's forgiveness. They're asking for God's deliverance. 
Look at verses 41 through 43. And it gets very specific. Chapter 8, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 41 through 43. It says, likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people, Israel, comes from a car- far country for your name's sake, for they shall hear of your great name and your mighty hand and of your outstretched arm, when he comes and prays towards this house, here in heaven, bless you, your dwelling place, and do according to all for which the foreigner calls to you, in order that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people, Israel, and that they may know that this house that I have built is called by your name. Verse 46 through 51, here we get to the specific case where Daniel finds himself. If they sin against you, for there is no one who does not sin, and you are angry with them, and give them to an enemy, so that they are carried away captive to the land of the enemy, far off or near, yet if they turn their heart in the land to which they have been carried captive, and repent and plead with you in the land of their captors, saying, We have sinned, and have acted perversely and wickedly, if they repent with all their mind and with all their heart in the land of their enemies who carried them captive, and pray to you, towards their land which you gave to their fathers the city that you have chosen and the house that i have built for your name then hear in heaven your dwelling place their prayer and their plea and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions that they have committed against you and grant them compassion in the sight of those who carried them captive that they may have compassion on them for they are your people and your heritage which you brought out of egypt from the midst of the iron furnace. So what is Daniel praying for? Forgiveness. Praying for God to rescue his people from exile. And this is Daniel's exact situation. And have compassion on them. Give them favor in the sight of the people who had carried them away captive. And as we look at the relationship that King Darius had with Daniel, you're going to see God had given compassion to Darius to have on Daniel, this captive, this person in exile. So when Daniel is praying in his room three times towards Jerusalem, that the idea is this. N.T. Wright, the scholar, calls what is happening here is when they're told to pray towards the east, It's done as a memory of what God had promised to do because the temple was the place where God said, I am putting my presence, I am making my name famous here. This is your land that I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm gonna make you a great nation from here. And so when the people of God are exiled and taken away from the temple and pray towards Jerusalem, They're praying towards the memory of the faithfulness of God that he would do what he said he would do when his people pray, repent, and call on him for forgiveness, that he would be faithful to hear in heaven, forgive them, and restore them to their land. And this is what is meant by him praying towards Jerusalem as he is praying God, even with Babylon destroying the temple, even with the temple not there, that to the Jerusalem is where God made the promise to, for him to be Israel's God, they would be his people, and he would bring them into the promised land. And this is why the author mentions Daniel is in his room, prayed three times a day, facing Jerusalem, because he is calling out to God on behalf of Israel, crying out, God forgive, we'll repent, get us out of exile, remember us, make your name famous, make your name great, God do this for us, deliver us, from here. And so this is what it's doing. And today we have access to the Father through who? Through Christ, right? And who became the true temple of God? Jesus did. Jesus said, I'm going to destroy this temple and then I will raise it again in three days. And the Jewish people around, they're like, What are you talking about? You're going to tear this building down and build it in three days? Like, you know how long it took to build this in the first place? There's no way you by yourself are going to. Because Jesus represents the true temple of God where God's presence dwells with his people. Temple always refers to God's presence dwelling with man where it unites heaven and earth together. And God's temple has come to the earth through Jesus Christ and through faith in him. We pray and that prayer goes through Jesus to the Father. You with me? 
And so he's become the true temple of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in us, and we become these living temples that are out here in the world. Okay? Verses 11 through 13. So uh, we get to what happens. They see Daniel praying. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any God or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? Don't they sound like a bunch of tattletales? It's exactly what they sound like, okay? Um, the king answered and said, The thing stands fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who was one of the exiles from Judah, pray, pays no attention to you, O king, or the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. So they go before him, accuse. He says, yep, this law is going to affect whoever disobeys. They're going to go into the lion's den. And then they drop the bombshell. It's Daniel. Now, Daniel is not just a no, uh, anybody in his kingdom. Because the very next verse, look at what it says about King Darius. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. And I don't think that that's a coincidence of, of Daniel praying and in that prayer of First Kings chapter 8 where it says, give them compassion. Here you see the compassion that the king has where he's distressed because that relationship he had with Daniel was a real relationship. It wasn't just you're my captive, you're my slave. He put him as one of the three officials that were over everybody else. And King Darius wants his kingdom run well. He wants people who are going to do the job that he asked them to do. He wants somebody who's going to run the kingdom the way he wants it done. And he trusted Daniel. And you can immediately tell there was a friendship there. There was a bond there that as soon as he heard the words, Daniel doesn't pray to you, I guarantee you his heart sank. Because he now has to throw his friend into the lion's den. And it says that he was troubled and went home that night. And what did he do? Try to find a way out, right? Couldn't find a way out of it. Try to think, how can I get out of this? How can I get Daniel out of this way? Then verse 15, then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then you get to verse 16. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. You see the seriousness of what King Darius had to do for Daniel. This king who wants the people to pray to him goes to his palace and fasts and prays for Daniel. So you see the favor of God that God gave to Daniel because Daniel remained faithful. And God's expecting the same thing of us wherever we find ourselves, no matter where we are. Remain faithful to him. And God's favor can be upon us. We can become the salt in a very bland world. We can become a light in a dark place where our actions can stand out. We're even in a place where it's like, this is the most ungodly place I could be. You can stand out and you can develop real relationships with people, even if they don't honor God, even if they don't love God. And so many times I've seen Christians, I'm not going to make friends with people that aren't believers because they're going to say and do things that I don't agree with and there's no real relationships formed but Daniel shows us those real relationships can be formed not only can they be formed but they can be loving relationships where you have the most powerful king trying to figure out how to save Daniel and goes and fast <laughs> and prays so we get to this place where you get to verse 19 Daniel's put into the lion's den stone is on top of it the next morning, look at what it says. Then at the break of day, the king arose and went in haste 
to the den of lions. Does anybody else know where that phrase and at the break of day, somebody went in haste? It's in the New Testament. I'll give you a hint. The resurrection, right? See, as I've been going through the study, I've come across from different authors that I've never thought of this in 40 years of living, okay? Never picked up on this, never saw this until I read it from the author, until I started studying this. That the early Christians used Daniel 6 as a complete picture and parallel of what happened to Jesus through his death, burial, and resurrection. Daniel cast into a den, a stone put on top and sealed. Jesus in a tomb, stone rolled in front, put, it, put in front of it. Then the stone rolled away. Daniel comes up out of the den, which we'll get to in a few minutes, just like the stone rolls away with the tomb, right? You with me? And so let's look and see what happens in Daniel. We'll continue reading and then we'll unpack the rest of it. And at 20, as he came near to the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God whom you serve continually been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. Can you imagine hearing that as Darius, where you thought this man is dead, I know he's dead, and then to hear those words, your expectation, the hope of what you were waiting for, the hope that he is not dead, and you hear him say, O king, live forever. The joy that he must have felt and experienced when he heard Daniel's voice. And then he says this, Daniel goes on and says, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they have not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken, where? Up, out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had what? Trusted in his God. So we're going to stop there. Daniel, rescued out of the lion's den, is brought up, brought out, and he's vindicated. He's been delivered. And then we're going to see in just a moment that there is judgment that's going to come upon his accusers. His accusers, the very next verse, it says, And the king commanded those men who had maliciously accused Daniel. What happened to them? They were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. So you have the deliverance of God, you have the vindication of Daniel coming up out of the den, and then you're gonna have this declaration that his God is a true living God, and Daniel prospers. You have the vindication, you have the exaltation of Daniel. In a very similar fashion, Jesus comes up out of the tomb, resurrects, he's vindicated, he's exalted, and his enemies, his accusers, are destroyed. Now, the Jewish people were expecting the Romans to instantly be killed physically, but Jesus destroyed them and defeated them and defeated the greatest enemy, death, by his resurrection. And so just like Daniel's accusers were destroyed, Jesus defeated his accusers by his death, burial, and resurrection. And this is how the early Christians were reading Daniel chapter 6, that they saw, wow, how God did this to Daniel is exactly what God did for Jesus. He was faithful to God. He was obedient even to the point of death. And because he lived the life that we could not live, he was vindicated and he was exalted. And now he's reigning in the world. Does that make sense? And so um, going through this for me, I had never picked up on anything like this. And you see the deliverance of this is just as miraculous as it was for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, where it says it clarifies no harm was done to them just like in the fiery furnace it was they didn't even smell like it there was nothing singed on them that this was the miraculous miracle of God that he had done and so not only does this story provide hope for the early Christians but it even provided hope for the Jewish people before the Messiah came it provided hope for them when they would read these stories and realize hey if I am in exile and I remain faithful to God that this is what God will do for us if we do what he calls us to do we will be vindicated, we will be exalted, and we will see our enemies defeated. And so you keep trusting God, and he will see you through, even if it means you die. 
because somehow even if you die, God will vindicate us in a way that we would never imagine. And so this story inspired hope in the exile, those that were living in exile. And then verses 25 through 26, King Darius makes a decree that all peoples, all nations, all languages should tremble before the God of Daniel. The opposite of what the accusers were trying to accomplish. God shows himself supreme. I'm the living God. I deserve all glory. I deserve all power. I deserve all worship. And then verses 26 and 27, this is what King Darius says about God. He's the living God. He has an eternal kingdom. He's the deliverer. He's the rescuer. He works in heaven and on earth. He unites heaven and earth together. And verse 28, look at what it says. So this Daniel what? Prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And so the first six chapters of Daniel show the challenge of pagan empires and the suffering and risks that it brings to the people of God who are suffering these pagan empires. But if the people of God remain faithful to him, they, God will deliver them, God will vindicate them, and God will exalt him. And this is what the early Jews for, of the first century are reading it. This is how they're reading this book. And then the early Christians picked up on it and said, wow, this is what God had planned all along. And we read a couple of sessions ago about Psalm chapter 2 where it talks about the kingdoms of man being arrogant and prompting themselves up and then God laughs at them in heaven and God has to show them. This is the book, this, this whole book of Daniel can be seen as a real life illustration of Psalm chapter 2 where the pagan kingdoms shake their fist at God and God laughs in heaven and it's like, I'm in control and don't mess with my people because I will come for my people and you will be judged and held accountable for your actions. And so that provides hope for us today that even though we see wickedness in the world, even though we see Kenan's doing things that they shouldn't, sometimes we think, God, what are you doing about God is doing something about it. He's always done something about it. Through Christ, he's in charge. All these other Kenans have already been defeated and God will hold these wicked kings and presidents, whoever they might be, and he will hold them accountable for their actions. And this is what gives us hope because we realize it's not up to us to reign in the kingdoms of God, to the kingdoms of man. That's God's job and God will judge. God will vindicate his faithful people. And so for us, it's this, the attitude of be faithful where we are, continue to do the good work of God, continue to point people to God, and trust that God will do for us what he's done in the book of Daniel. So now we get to Daniel chapter 7, because I said we would get through Daniel chapter 7 tonight, and we will, okay? So hold on, we're going to make it. So Daniel 6 and 7, I already mentioned they go very close together, because you have this miraculous story of one who comes up, vindicated, all of this. And then we get into Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, where we hear the phrase, son of man. And this is a phrase that a lot of people have done a lot of debates about, and they've done a lot of flip charts and visuals and posters and conferences about. But the Son of Man, when we look at it, we're not going to look at this from the mindset of end times. What is God going to do at the end of the world? We're going to look at the Son of Man as it relates to Daniel chapter 7 in the context in which it was written and what it means in the book that it was written on. So we're not going to get into when is the rapture and when's this and that. Those are all great discussions that can be had outside Daniel chapter 7, okay? Not for the purpose of Daniel 7 where we go into all of that. And so we're going to look tightly at what it says here. So this book is different from every, this chapter is different from every other chapter that has come before it. And chapter 7 is really, chapter 6 was a climax of the first six chapters, but chapter 7 is a climax of the entire book. This is what the whole book is centered on. This is what the whole book has been leading towards. Everything that came before it was building to this moment, and everything after it is because of what happened here in chapter 7. So this is, if you want to know what the most important chapter in Daniel is, this is it, right here. This is it. This is the chapter you want to look at. And how it's different from the ones that come before is Daniel himself has a vision. It's not a king. It's not some pompous king. It's Daniel but Daniel, the ironic part, is Daniel can't interpret the own dream that was given to him. He has to, ask, he has to ask someone else to come and interpret it for him. But can another human being interpret it for him? No. Okay. Earlier in the book, Daniel was asked to interpret the dreams. But here, he can't, so he asks someone. And who comes to interpret it? None other than a heavenly being 
that was from the heavenly courts of the ancient of days. And so Daniel in 7 is important, like I mentioned. It's the heart of this book. And how we're going to look at chapter 7 is how the people in the first century and how the people during Jesus' time read Daniel chapter 7 because you're going to see where the Son of Man gets importance and how even in the early Christian church, how the Son of Man, even how Jesus himself viewed the Son of Man. And so this is important because even Jesus recognizes the importance of this chapter. And in the middle of the chapter, verse 13, you're going to see this. I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. In Aramaic, what that phrase son of man literally means is a human being. That's what it means. But it's not just any human being, as we're going to see. It's not just, sure, in Aramaic, it could be a son of man, just a regular human being. Ezekiel is called a son of man, and it means just this, a normal human being. But when we, tur- when we look further into this chapter, we're going to see son of man cannot just mean a normal person like you and I. It is somebody much different, somebody much greater, and can only be one and only person to fulfill the role of the Son of Man. And Jesus picks up this use of Son of Man, and you see it used in the New Testament to describe who he was and also what he was doing in the world while he was living. And this chapter is full of apocalyptic writing. The very first few verses of this chapter, you're going to see the images and the imagery of beasts. There's four beasts. This is apocalyptic writing. There are not, when we talk about the beast of a lion, there's not like a real lion, a big lion going around ruling the world. You're not going to see a bear with three tusks in real life ruling the world. This is apocalyptic language. And apocalyptic, remember, means a revealing, something that God has revealed from heaven to earth to man through a messenger. And here Daniel is given a dream because God wants to reveal something to man about what he's doing in the world. And what happens in chapter 7 is so revolutionary that it will change the world one day and the world will never be the same once this event takes place. And so this is why it's important. Look at the vision of the beasts. Verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel saw a dream and visions of his head as he lay in his bed. Then he wrote down the dream and told the sum of the matter. Daniel declared, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea, and four great beasts came up out of the sea, different from one another. The first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. Then as I looked, its wings were plucked off, and it was lifted up from the ground and made to stand on two feet like a man, and the mind of a man was given to it. And behold, another beast, a second one like a bear. It was raised up on one side. It had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth, and it was told, Arise, devour much flesh. After this I looked, and behold, another like a leopard, with four wings of a bird on its back. And the beast had four heads, and a dominion was given to it. After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, terrifying and dreadful and exceedingly strong. It had great iron teeth. It devoured in broken pieces and stamped what was left with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another horn, a little one, before which three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. Mouth speaking great things is arrogant speaking. It's somebody making a name for themselves, talking a lot of smack if we were to talk in today's terms. Then in verse 9, as I looked, thrones were placed, important, keep a mental note of that, and the ancients of days took his seat on a throne, which means there's another throne, who's that for, keep it in mind, his clothing was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool, his throne was fiery flames, and its wheels were burning fire, a stream of fire issued and came out from before him, a thousand thousand served him, and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment, and the books were opened. I looked then because of the sound of the great words that the horn was speaking, and as I looked, the beast was killed, and its body destroyed, and given over to be burned with fire. As for the rest of their beast, their dominion was taken away, but their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. 
I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancients of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Okay? Got a good grasp of what's happening here in the vision? Okay? When it mentions the four beasts come out of the sea, does anybody know how the ancient Near East and the Jews viewed the seas? Does anybody know? What's that? Not in this sense. Not in this sense. How did they view the seas? It's not from God. Not a nation. Okay. I'll give you the hint. Okay. They saw the seas as representing or identifying with chaos. Okay. It was these chaotic, dark forces. All right. So when you see the four beasts arising out of the sea, you're looking at four kingdoms that are arising out of chaos, that are arising out of darkness, that are arising out of evil. These are bad kingdoms. These are the kingdoms of man that have evil intentions. They're wicked. They're chaotic. They're devastating. They're destroyers. They don't do anything but bring death. And that when they come out of the sea, it's God saying these people are evil and chaotic. If you remember Genesis 1, 1 and 2, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then you see the part in verse 2 where it says, And the Spirit of God hovered over the waters and the earth was void and without form. And what does God do to the chaos? He brings order, right? And so you're here, this is imagery. This is just as that was an echo of creation where you have the Spirit hovering over the seas where God took what was disordered, ordered, right? You get bring an order in the world. God is going to do new creation here with the Son of Man. That God is going to do something new. That with these kingdoms of the world, it is time for their rule to end. And so when he mentions these four beasts coming out of the sea, and then there's the Ancient of Days, and the Ancient of Days is given, and these beasts are destroyed, it is God saying, look, I'm doing a creation that the world has never seen, and when I do this, my kingdom is going to establish forever. And it mentions this fourth beast that will rise up that's different from all the others, and it's got ten horns, and then one of these little horns comes out and makes a very arrogant stance and tries to do its worst against the world. And this pompous human kingdom, they're doing what all these other kingdoms do. All the kings of the world, they, they take over other people, they build statues, they force people to bow down to them, they're making people worship their gods because that's what these kingdoms do. And what kingdom do you think in Jesus' day represents a kingdom like this? Roman Empire captures Jerusalem, lording it over them, using death as the greatest tool to get the people of Israel to do what they say. If you fall out of line, we will kill you because we got the greatest weapon in the world, which is death. And so a lot of scholars will say that this fourth beast refers to the Roman Empire during this time. And that this is what is happening. They're raising their heads, they're going forth, and they're doing all of this. Again, is it important to know who this kingdom really is at the end of the day? No, because all these kingdoms are to be representative of all human kingdoms that live their kingdoms apart from God. It represents all pagan empires. They're all doing the same thing. They're all rebelling against God. They're always thinking they're in charge and not God. And then you get to verse 10. If you look back at verse 10, at the very end of it, it says, the court sat in judgment and the books were opened. And everything else that we've been looking at has been a earth view look. Everything happening on the earth. But here we are put in the book to a totally different scenario. We are now in like a courtroom setting where there's these thrones. The Ancient of Days takes his seat on the throne and it says the court sat in judgment and the books were opened. So what is God about to do? He's about to judge the world. He's about to judge these kingdoms. He's going to judge and find human, pagan kingdoms guilty. But in a courtroom setting, someone's found guilty, 
and someone's declared what? Innocent. Someone is vindicated. And it's important that we pick up this imagery of a court setting because this is what's happening. You have the world is on trial, and who are they going against? Who's the other party? We know the pagan empire is about to be judged, but who's going to be vindicated? Well, we read it here in verse 13. Who's going to be vindicated is the Son of Man. The Son of Man will be vindicated, and he will be exalted. Remember I told you to pay attention to who are the thrones for? You have one is the Ancient of Days, and then the other is considered, there's a rabbi, uh, older ancient rabbi, who said that that other throne belonged to the throne of David, which literally meant the Messiah who would come to rule in the world. And so the early first century Jews thought that other throne was reserved for the Messiah. Now, what, what do we know about Jesus? He is doing what right now? He is sitting at the right hand of the Father, right? And so all the way back in Daniel, you see this Son of Man is going to place himself on a throne. But this isn't a human. This isn't a second God. Somehow this God is, has a Son of Man, and the early Christian writers picked up on this idea and even said that the throne was for the Lamb of God. And somehow the Ancient of Days and the Lamb of God, they're not two separate gods, they're one. And this is how God is demonstrating his kingship in the world is you got the Ancient of Days, the Father, and you got the Lamb of God sitting on his throne. And they are ruling in the world on heaven, at, in heaven as on earth. And so somehow the Son of Man is going to fulfill this role. And then you get to verse 13. And remember I told you the Son of Man is not just a human being like us. And how do we know it's not just a human being? Because it says the Son of Man was given dominion, kingship, and glory. Those three words are characteristics that are always described of God, the sovereign, the king of the universe. So this Son of Man cannot be a human just like you and I. This Son of Man has to be God, has to be divine. And we see in Christ that Jesus became human, but he was fully God and fully man, that only one person in the universe could fulfill this role as the Son of Man, and that was Jesus Christ himself. And you notice the Son of Man comes to the ancients of days, not upwards, I mean not downwards, he comes upwards, just like Daniel is lifted out of the den. The Son of Man comes in the clouds up to the ancients of days, vindicated, he is exalted and given the kingdom forever and ever and ever. So, Here's where we are at this point. The beasts of the world and the son of man are representatives of things in the world. The four beasts represent the human empires. The son of man represents God, represents Jesus, who we're going to look at in just a moment. But the son of man also is a representative for the saints of the most high of God's people. Look at... Um, Go down to uh, sorry, give me a second. Look, go to verse twenty-seven in chapter seven, and it says, "In the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to who, the people of the saints of the Most High God." So, what the Son of Man does with his life, living obedient. This is a throwback. You can write this chapter down, Isaiah 42, and you can go back and look at it on your own. But Isaiah 42 talks about how, behold, this is my servant, Israel. And this is talking about the Messiah, and he's going to do what Israel failed to do. He would live the life that Israel kept failing to live, and he would be successful, and he would establish justice, and he would establish God's kingdom. And so Jesus has always represented the people God. He was able to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He was able to do for Israel what Israel couldn't do for itself. So when it says that he received the kingdom, then that means every faithful person who believes in him because he received the kingdom who also possesses the kingdom. We do, his people. And this is how the son of man can be given the kingdom. But then a few verses later in verse 27, we see that the kingdom was given to the people of the saints of the most high God. He's representing us and standing in our place and when we put our faith in him, he is interceding to the Father on our behalf, saying, look at what I've done. They're my people. They believe in me. I love them. They love me. 
vindicate them, exalt them, and put them in authority over your creation. And this is the beauty of the Son of Man. And we'll have that forever and ever and ever and ever. And this text was read this way by the first century Jews, and it was read by Jesus himself this way. And I know we're running a little over time, but I have to share this because it's important. You guys ever heard of a guy named Josephus? Anybody heard of him? Okay, he was a Jewish historian who lived during the time of Rome when Rome sieged Jerusalem, took it over, destroyed the temple. And in Josephus' life, he was a faithful Jew, but then when the Roman Empire came, he said, ha, see ya, and went to work and got, you know, under the Roman Empire, became their little historian and started to work for them. So the faithful Jews that remained where they were, they were upset with him and said, Josephus is a traitor because he left us and now he's working for the Roman Empire. But what Josephus did, the beauty of what he did is he wrote down and put the history of God's people. And Rome had a book called The Antiquities of the Romans, and he writes a book called The Antiquities of the Jews, and saying, yeah, 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 you have your cool little stories, you got your cool history, but look at what we got, we got some history as well. And so he hits the book of Daniel, and in the book of Daniel, he points out a lot of different things. He points out chapter two, but when you get to the part where it says the stone was cut out, and it became a great mountain, and it crushed the statue, surprisingly, well actually not surprisingly, he does not tell us. He gets to that part and says, you know what, we're not going to talk about that right now. We're going to talk about that later. Why wouldn't he talk about that? Because that stone was going to come and defeat the Roman Empire. And if he says the Roman Empire is going to be defeated, what's going to happen to him? He's going to die. Surprisingly, he mentions every other chapter in Daniel, except guess what other chapter? Daniel chapter 7. Why do you think? Because the Messiah was coming to establish himself as king of the world and universe. He's in charge and not you, Caesar. And Rome is not in charge. God is. So he leaves it out because he knows what that would mean to the Roman Empire. So what am I trying to get out here? Is that the Son of Man always had the connotation that it referred to the Messiah who would come and establish his kingdom. The only problem that the early Jewish people had is the Messiah came in an unexpected way. He did not physically defeat the Romans. He did it in a way the world was not expecting. When he, not only were the Romans defeated, but Jesus defeated death. This is why, oh death, where is your sting? Because Jesus had defeated our true enemy, which was this death, this separation from God. And he accomplished this victory that was unexpected to the watching world. So all these things happen, and you get to Jesus describes himself in Mark chapter 13. If you have a moment, turn there, and I promise you we don't have much longer. Um, but I want to show you this because it's super important. Jesus himself refers to what he's doing in the world as the Son of Man. And in Mark 13, verse 14, he says, But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Does anybody know what the abomination of desolation refers to? What Jesus was referring to? The abomination of desolation would be the destruction of the temple. Now, when did the destruction of the temple happen? Boom. If I had a prize, I'd give it to you. 70 AD is when the temple was destroyed. Okay? And again, Jesus says, the, temple's, the temple, with Jesus coming, the temple is no longer needed, right? So the temple would be destroyed, but this would be a marker for the disciples and for the early Christians and for the faithful Jews to realize, look, when the temple is destroyed, you are going to know Daniel 7 has been fulfilled. So the abomination of desolation, we're looking for that. Then you get down to verse 24 through 27. Actually, no, I'm sorry. Back up to verse uh, 15. Sorry. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in these days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such distribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never would be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. Now, I know in those verses there's a lot of debate 
on a lot of times people will take that and say this is talking to this end times thing and what's happening but if we remember the context of the abomination of desolation the destruction of the temple if we go back to what daniel chapter 7 says that this is talking about a specific time period and he tells the people flee to the mountains and then in verse 30 you could see that this generation will not pass away until all these things take place so so many times people will take that text and say this is all these future events that's going to happen at the end days but when jesus says these things will not pass away and this generation will not pass away until all this takes place what does that mean if that is a future future event the generation that was there that jesus was talking to has already died and gone and it says they will not pass away that means they would still be living today in order to see the end times come. So what's happening? He's saying what is about to happen, this abomination, all this desolation, all this tribulation that you're about to experience, it's gonna happen within your generation. And when you see it, recognize that I have done a new thing in the world. And you can look at verse 24 where it says, but in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. And that always refers to a period of suffering. And Josephus in the antiquities of the Jews, he details that when Rome came to siege Jerusalem, he describes the horror in which Rome attacked and besieged. They caused a famine in the city of Jerusalem. And guards would go in and if they would find any food in someone's house, they would take it. And if the older person, if an old man wanted to hold on and clench the food in his hands, they would beat him until he dropped it. If there was a woman that wouldn't give up their food, they would rip out parts of their hair so they would drop the food. And if they saw a house that was boarded up, they would barge in because they knew those people were hiding something. So the people were starving. They, would, they said that at this time, if a loved one was about to die, they would, if they were to give that person some kind of food or some kind of drink, it could save their life, but they would not do it to preserve their own life. So even their loved ones, they were allowing to die to preserve self. And it got so bad that it sh- shares a story, he shares a story of a mom who had an infant and got so upset with her plight. And she said, I don't even want my kid to grow up in this kind of environment. Says she roasted her kid and ate half of it. And the guards came in and smelled something And even the Roman guards who were doing evil, wicked things were completely disgusted and left her alone. This is a tribulation of the Jewish people that God had promised would happen if they didn't repent, if they didn't turn. And when you're going through this by the Roman Empire, this pagan nation, you are suffering. This is why it says it's not good to have, you don't want to have a baby during this time because it was awful. It was horrible. And then it said that, he goes on to describe that even some of them said, you know what, we're going to desert to Rome. We're going to go seek freedom in Rome. Like, hey, we're done with this. And so it said that some of the people would swallow gold because they would go to the Roman and the Roman guards, and if they got in, it, it would excrete it, and now they got some money in order to have a living. So people were swallowing gold. Well, somebody from the Roman Empire saw someone do that and realized all these deserters were coming, and their bellies were filled with gold. So you know what these guards did? When the deserters came to them to seek safety, they cut them up, cut their bellies, and got their gold. He, Josephus said in one night's time, 2,000 people were dissected. And this is the abomination of desolation, the defeat of the temple. And here Jesus is saying, look, when you see this, No, your vindication is coming. No, your deliverance is coming to you. And Jesus mentions in verse 24, I'm sorry, in verse 26, and they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. In Mark 14, 62, you can jot that down as well. I'll read it to you. Jesus is standing before Caiaphas when he's arrested. And Caiaphas says, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the son of man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. 
And here you can write this psalm down too. You can go and look at it. Psalm 110. When Jesus makes this declaration, he's remembering Psalm 110, but also remembering Daniel chapter 7, and he combines this. And the gospel writers, Matthew and Luke, also refer to Jesus as the Son of Man, and they say, from now on, you will see the Son of Man, referring to Jesus as fulfilling the visions of Daniel chapter 7. And this is why in Matthew 28, 20, when Jesus is about to ascend to heaven, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, And you know where that's taken from? Daniel chapter 7, verse 14. And so what God had planned to do in Daniel chapter 7 is fulfilled in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. With his death, burial, and resurrection, all kingdoms, all powers, all rulers have been defeated, and anyone who places their faith in them is vindicated, is exalted, and inherits the kingdom of God forever, forever and ever. N.T. Wright on your handout, I hope I have this quote there, Ancient of Days, if you see Ancient of Days right after N.T. Wright, that's not right. That Ancient of Days shouldn't be there. I made a typo. It should be, Jesus' resurrection was when the Son of Man, the people of the saints of the Most High, received the kingdom which is God's and only God's, but which is now shared with one like the Son of Man, the stone that was cut out, the one who represents the saints of the Most High, all the way back at the beginning of of that statue where the stone comes out and crushes the beast. This was all alluding towards the Messiah, and this is what Jesus has accomplished. New creation has come. He's king of the world, and in him we're put right, and we're brought from death to life. And Jesus' death, burial, and his resurrection assured Jesus' vindication and it ensured his exaltation. And I'll read to you what I have here. God's kingdom has been established forever, even though it came different than everyone expected. Many Jews expected a physical defeat of Rome, but Jesus defeated all powers, all rulers, and defeated death itself, and now is at the right hand of the Father and has given us, his people, the kingdom. And so this is the beauty of the Son of Man, and this is the fulfillment of, of Daniel chapter 7 is what we see in Jesus Christ, that God has defeated all empires. Even though they're out there and they're trying to rule their hand and they're trying to show how powerful they are, and they, at times we might get fearful, at times we might get afraid, but God has defeated them, and God has defeated our truest enemy, which is death itself, and that we will not experience a death of, that we don't have to fear death, because yes, we might die physically, But absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we will rule over God's creation now until forever. And this is the beauty. Christ didn't go and do this just to have a kingdom by himself for himself. He came on our behalf so that we could enjoy his kingdom and have dominion over it. He earned it. It's his kingdom. But he gives it to us, his people, to the faithful people of God who say, No matter what man tells us to do, we're going to obey God no matter what. If he delivers us, that's awesome. But even if he doesn't, he will still vindicate us and exalt us. And he can do that in your life. We see in the first seven chapters that this living God is a God who is highly invested in our lives. That he cares about every detail. What's planned long ago, the promises that he gave, he kept every one of them kept all the promises, planned it out. A God who is absent, a God who is distant, wouldn't think through all these things, wouldn't plan all of this, and it's all motivated by his love for us because we are created in his image to bear that image in the world and to be a light and a hope to the people that are walking in darkness because guess what? God wants kings to come to know him. King Nebuchadnezzar humbled him, but then King Nebuchadnezzar said, you are the living God. And what did God do? Restore him and gave him even more. God has always been about using his people to reach the nations. He cares about the other nations that don't know him. And he cares about us and wants to use us. And so Daniel 7, to me, going through these seven chapters, these last four weeks, has been, has opened my eyes to the beauty. And I sit back in awe of this God who has done this amazing thing, who has decided to not leave us in our sin that if any of us 
pray towards him, repent, and ask for forgiveness, God gives it to us. And he's our hope. He's our strength. And these stories, it's like, hey, you know what? Our country, at any moment, things could happen, and this country could go south. And we might be told one day, hopefully not in our lifetime, but one day it might come down, you can't worship God, you must do this. And we know, hey, you know what? Look, what happened for Daniel, if I keep my faith and I pray to them, to, to God and not to these people, God will deliver me, God will vindicate me, God will exalt me, even if I experience death. And so it's hope and exile. And all of us right now, we could sit back and say, we live in Babylon, right? We live in Babylon. You might work in Babylon at the same time. But we all live there, and God's, God's commandments are the same to us. Be like Daniel in the sense of holding trust in God. Does that make sense? Any questions? I know I said a lot. I know we went through a lot. And if you have any questions, you can always email me, come talk. Any questions now? Yes. The Son of Man, when it relates to Genesis, in what, w in, in what way? Oh, okay, and they did something with the sons of men. Yeah, there are a reference to the sons of man, but those sons of man, again, Aramaic and Hebrew, it can refer to just a man, a human, like somebody, a regular human being. So the son of man, where it's different is, son of man, Ezekiel was called the son of man in the Old Testament, but he wasn't the Messiah. He wasn't the son of man. It just is a way of referring to people in general. They came down, the angels, well, some people say they were angels, but these people came down and intermarried with the sons of men. And so really it's talking about the men who were living on the earth that this group of men where the son of man is somebody different because he comes into this throne. He sits on a throne that belongs to God. He's given power, dominion, and glory, and that can only go to God himself where the other references to the son of man don't reference this power, this dominion, this glory, and kingship. Only the son of man, as Daniel 7 describes it, has that, that tie into it. I don't know if that makes sense. Any other questions? That's a good question. Any other questions? Thoughts? All right. Thank you guys for coming out. We will do a part two later in the year. So uh, Pastor Brian will be doing a Wednesday night class in March. And there's going to be some other things that will happen on Wednesday nights in the future, but we don't have those all nailed out yet. But he is, Pastor Brian will do the next study in the first Wednesday in March. Because we're January, February. Yeah, in March. And then Daniel will do later in the year, and we'll do chapters 8 through 12, okay? So let me pray for you guys before you go. Father God, I pray for each person that is in this room. And Father, we thank you that we know the love of Christ. And Father, we thank you for your word, that it is a constant reminder that you are a faithful God who always does what you say that you will do. And Father, as we look to you, as we pray to you, and as we keep our faith in you, Father God, you will vindicate us, you will exalt us, and we thank you for that, Father God. And I pray for each one here that you would continue to guide and direct their lives, that you would reveal the steps and plans that you have for them, that you would provide for all their needs, that you already have given them everything they need to, godly, to have a godly life. But Father, I pray that they would walk in the spirit of your spirit, Father God, and they would be able to accomplish all the things you have for them. We love you, you're awesome, you're our king. It's in your name we pray, amen. Have a blessed night, guys. Take care.